Okay, <coughs> please have your attention. Welcome this year uh, to this year's annual Joint Scott Lecture. And on behalf of the Edinburgh Sir Walter Scott Club, I'd like to thank our co-sponsors, the English Department at the University of Edinburgh, and also our hosts, the Faculty of Advocates for this room, and also, I believe, for refreshments afterwards. Uh, all in all, it's hard to think of a more appropriate location for this event, at the heart of an institution and building, both of which were central in Scott's literary and professional life. On your way here, you look past through the high-arched Parliament Hall, home of the original Scottish Parliament, prior to its being handed over to the lawyers after the Union of 1707, and where the senior advocates walked around in small groups to avoid being overheard, copied in this by duty members such as Scott, eager to give the impression that they too had business. Positioned near the entrance you have come through into the library is the statue of a sedentary Scot by John Greenshields, with Sikh Sedabat at the foot. Thus, or in this way, he sat, according to some, the most lifelike of the multiple artistic representations of Scott. Proceeding stealthily through the reading room occupied by present-day lawyers with their laptops, one might be reminded of the great collections of manuscripts and rare books, now largely transferred to the National Library of Scotland, which provided the core of Scott's early scholarly reading. And the room where we're presently seated also has Scott's association, uh, Scott associations. I've just noticed there's a, uh, a David Wilkie portrait of Scott up there, for example. And one year for this event, the faculty exhibited the seat in which Scott actually did sit as a clerk to the Court of Session, a particularly comfy and somewhat scratched green leather armchair, not dissimilar to the upholstered ones now here, where the luckier among you are comfortably and hopefully patiently sitting. There are two things to introduce today, and I'll try to be brief. The first concerns the award of the club's annual prize consisting of an inscribed medal and a cheque. Uh, this started off way back in the club's history as an essay prize, but for the last five years has been awarded to the final year undergraduate in the English department at Edinburgh University, achieving the best marks in Scottish literature. This year's winner is Joe Christie, who regretfully has fallen ill during the last few hours and cannot be with us this evening. Joe graduated this summer with a first class honours degree in English literature. Whilst at Edinburgh, he divided time between his academic career and his involvement in student theatre, serving as president of the Edinburgh University Theatre Company during his second year. Joe performed in and directed various productions at the Bedlam Theatre by playwrights such as David Grieg. His enthusiasm for Scottish writers was nurtured through a curriculum where he read works as diverse as Walter Scott's Ivanhoe and Muriel Park's, uh, Sparks, the <coughs> ballad of Peckham Rye. During his third year abroad at McGill University in Montreal, Montreal, much of Joe's coursework examined the cultural links between Scotland and Quebec, and this inspired him on his return to Edinburgh to focus his final year of honour study on Scottish literature. Alongside a first-class dissertation that examined how notions of belonging sit within the queer literary canon, it is Joe's writing on critically overlooked Scottish writers of the 20th century, the likes of Jesse Kesson, and fellow Shetlander uh, Willa Muir, which has led him to be awarded the Walter Scott Medal for 2018. Uh, John has emailed, uh, Joe rather, has emailed his sincerest thanks to those involved in the award and would like to thanks be passed on in particular to David Farrier, Carol Jones, Aaron Kelly, and last but not least, Penny Fielding. And it's Penny that I'm going to turn to accept the prize on behalf of Joe's, on behalf of Joe. The prize consists of an inscribed medal there. I think the cheque has already been dealt with, and there's a volume of pass addresses to our club. 
there as well, and a photo opportunity. <laughs> Finally, it's a great pleasure to introduce David Bruce as this evening's speaker. David is a former director of the Scottish Film Council and of the Edinburgh International Film Festival. He's also a former director of the British University's Film and Television Council, where he developed a particular interest in film as a resource for research, and which led, during his time at the Scottish Film Council, to the foundation of the Scottish Film Archive, now part of the National Library of Scotland, as the Moving Image Archive. Not only is he interested in old movies, but also in old photographs. He is chairman of the historical group of the Royal Photographic Society, of which body he is a fellow. His new book, which I can brandish in front of you here, uh, written with Dr. Alison Morrison Lowe on the earlier photographer, Dr. John Adamson, brother of the more famous Robert, was published by the National Museums of Scotland on Monday. His other books include Sun Pictures, 1973. When I looked at the date of that, I wondered, can this be 1973? Yes, it is. He, as I, like me, has been at it a long time, and I'm pleased to say he's still doing it. Uh, uh, his other books are, are, among his other books, Edinburgh, Past and Present, 1990, with the late Maurice Lindsay, Scotland, the Movie, 1996, and Griatrix, uh, the true story of the photographer and forger pursued by a Glasgow cop to New York in 1866. What Walter Scott did for Hollywood, today's lecture, began many years ago, he tells me, as a piece of light entertainment, but gradually acquired more gravitas as it was subjected to scrutiny and comment by a succession of audiences who took it more seriously than perhaps David Bruce did at first. It also widened out to include writers other than Scott whose contribution to cinema and whose influence through cinema on our own culture may have significantly affected us for better or for worse. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our speaker today, David Bruce. Well, thank you very much for that, for that nice introduction, and indeed uh, for allowing me to talk here. The last time I was in this building, it was in pursuit of the aforementioned Greatrex, who was tried in court three uh, down the road and was found guilty of forging one pound notes. At the time, I'm talking about 1860s, when doing a thing like that could very well lead to your execution. Fortunately, that didn't happen to him. It's a good story. Uh, you can get copies by going to Amazon. <laughs> or, etc. Anyway. Thank you very much. I, I'm glad you mentioned that this started off as a piece of light entertainment, and it is indeed my intention to try and entertain you. I suspect you're actually going to tell me more than I'm going to tell you, because you know all about Walter Scott, and I only know about him from certain uh, dimensions. But let's go. Um, an American professor teaching an advanced literature course online begins by saying to her students, you will not have heard of Walter Scott. I trust that you have all heard of Walter <laughs> Scott. And, and indeed, with Pleasant Company accepted, of course, how many of us, are, and indeed of our population, have read a Scott novel or poem in the last year, last five years, last ten years? I know that you all have, because you, it's your bedtime reading every night. But I suspect that the population as a whole has not read many Walter Scott novels recently. It's never hard for us to comprehend just how important, well, I don't make sure this worked, hang on, is yes, that's the talk, and that's the portrait. It's not the same one as that, no. Um, it's never hard for us to comprehend just how important and immensely popular globally Scott's work was in his lifetime, and for at least a hundred years afterwards. Indeed, for the sake of context, it's worth considering the chronology. Scott was born in 1771, as you know, two years to the day after the birth of one Napoleon Bonaparte, whose biography Scott would write. 1771 is more than 120 years before the birth of cinema. 
The Lady of the Lake, which triggered the so-called Highland Revival, was published in 1810, Waverley in 1814. Scott died in 1832, still 60 years ahead of the movies, and even seven years before the formal announcement of the invention of photography. Though to be fair, the world's oldest photograph does date from 1827. So we can claim that he did live just into the era of images captured from the light by optics and chemistry. But we still have to explain why his work was being mined by the medium of cinema from the moment of its invention. And that despite the paradox that his medium, the written word, could really only show up as snippets in intertitles in silent films, and was never spoken from the screen for a further 30 years. But from the very start of his writing career, Scott's continuity of influence was enormous and reached well beyond the literary world into quite unexpected places. And as you know, not always was his influence seen as entirely benign. He was even accused of being responsible for a war. Mark Twain it was who said the southern states of America suffered from Sir Walter disease and that Scott, particularly through Ivanhoe, was responsible for starting the American Civil War, as the South spent more time on chivalry, even mounting tournaments, than establishing industry. You will all, of course, be familiar with the excellent book by Stuart Kelly, who I can't was actually a, a president here, he was a chairman here, not so long ago. He's not here, is he, before I start quoting him. No, that's all right, then. Uh, <clears throat> you'll be familiar with his work, Scotland, The Man Who Invented a Nation. In it, Kelly describes Twain as the arch detester of Scott. And I'm very grateful to Mr. Kelly, who publishes Twain's invective in full, always worth enjoying. I'm sure you, of all people, will be familiar with the passage, but I think it is worth reminding ourselves of it for something that comes up later. And it goes like this. I think you've all heard this before. You've all been subjected to Mark Twain on Scott. No, some people shake their head. Right, here we go. Then comes Sir Walter Scott with his enchantments and his single, and by his single might, checks this wave of progress and even turns it back, sets the world in love with dreams and phantoms, with decayed and swinish forms of religion, with decayed and degraded systems of government, with a silliness and emptiness, sham grandeurs, sham gods, and sham chivalries of a brainless and worthless, long vanished society. He did measureless harm, more real and lasting harm perhaps than any other individual who ever wrote. Most of the world has now lived good part of these harms, though by no means all of them. But in our South they flourish pretty forcefully still. Not so forcefully as half a generation ago perhaps, but still forcefully. There the genuine and wholesome civilization of the 19th century is curiously confused and commingled with the Walter Scott Middle Age sham civilization. And so you have practical, common sense, progressive ideas and progressive works mixed up with the jewel, the inflated speech, and the juge and romanticism of an absurd past that is dead and out of charity ought to be buried. But for the Sir Walter disease, the character of the southerner would be wholly modern in place of modern and medieval mixed and the South would be full, a fully a generation further advanced than it is. It was Sir Walter that made every gentleman in the South a major or a colonel or a general or a judge before the war, and it was he also that made these gentlemen value these bogus decorations, for it was he that created rank and caste down there, and also reverence for rank and caste and pride and pleasure in them. Enough is laid on slavery without fouling upon it these creations and contributions from Sir Walter. There. And there's more. <clears throat> a conference in Canada in 1987 was told that such was Scott's popularity on the US frontier that it influenced not only the fictional shapes of Wild West novels and films, but also the behaviour of real cowboys. It was also told that The Lady of the Lake was translated into the Mohawk tongue as early as 1814, just four years after its publication when the native people saw some relationship between the Gallic clan society and their own way of life. However, here is a different sphere of influence, Scott and the birth of photography. In January of 1839, William Henry Fox Talbot of Laycock announced his invention. He did so in panic because Louis-Jacques Mondet Daguerre had just made the same announcement in Paris. In fact, their systems were entirely different, and Talbot's negative positive process was the father of all photographic methods, including cinema film, till the coming of the digital. 
Talbot's first, the first book of photographs, was The Pencil of Nature in 1844. His second, also in 44, was the first book to be offered for sale that included photographs, with some pictures in Scotland, quite explicitly in the footsteps of Walter Scott, because Talbot was a great admirer. This is Talbot's Loch Catron, famous, of course, for Scott's Lady of the Lake. As if you didn't know, this edifice in Princess Street is near Waverley Station. It is 200 feet high and 200 feet and 6 inches high and is the largest monument to a writer in the world. The photograph, a colour type by David Octavius Field and Robert Anderson, dates from 1845, which you can tell because of the monuments built, the statue is not yet in place. But look at this. John Henning as Idiochotry from the Antiquary, with Miss Coburn as Miss Warder. John Henning was also born in 1771. He was a sculptor who made busts of the famous, including Scott, but also the Duke of Wellington, James Watt, and Sir Humphrey Davy, who was incidentally an early, an early explorer of the idea of photography. Henning was so fascinated by the Elgin marbles that he spent 12 years modeling them for a frieze on the exterior of the Athenaeum. Miss Coburn was the daughter of Henry Lord Coburn. And this image was made at Bonale Towers. <coughs> the Victorians were very keen on tableau, useful if you want people to stay still for a while to be photographed. But a few decades on, and the pictures and the tableau began to move. Cinema at its birth, at the end of the 19th <coughs> and the beginning of the 20th century, was essentially a creature of the showgrounds, as panoramas and dioramas had been before. And like them, it had grand pretensions. And what better way of aspiring to sophistication than attempting the high ground of culture, the novels of Sir Walter Scott, a major figure in world literature. So it's not surprising that in Silver's first decades, there was a rash of Scott-based movies. The first of two Rob Roy's were both made in 1911. This one is particularly interesting because it was, in fact, the first British Three real fiction film. Based on a theatrical version of the story, it was made entirely in Scotland by United Films of 4 Union Street, Glasgow, and was even shot in the places specified in the novel. Sadly, the film is now lost, but there is a fragment of a few frames showing Rob Roy at the Clachan Inn at Aberfoyle. I said there were two Rob Roys in 1911. This one had a rival production made by Gaumont. There is a fine account of the tussle between them in a new book. Early Cinema in Scotland, published by Edinburgh University Press. The relevant chapter by Caroline Metz, Britain's first feature film, tells the full story, and it is great, highly recommended. Incidentally, 1911 <coughs> also saw release of Robert Bruce's episode de la guerre de l'indépendance écossaise, so French awareness of Scottish history was alive and very probably due to Scott. The next Rob Roy was an American version, made in America by Eclair in 1930, and there was also another one by Gaumont, one in 1922. <laughs> Pause while you take that one in. The bright, and I hope you could take notes of this next bit because it has to go very rapidly, it requires a lot of concentration. The Bride of Lammermoor from Vitagraph appears as early as 1909. There was an Italian Lucia de Lammermoor in 1910, and an American Bride of Lammermoor in 1914. So Scott was already in the productions and on the screens of the USA. Canworth is also 99, and so too was Lochin. Uh -huh. Who recurs in 1911, 1915, 1924, etc. French Pathé made Quentin Durward in 1910 and again in 1912, the same year as American Guy Mannering, the latter being described in my moving picture world as, quotes, a rattling good story of Scotch smugglers, gypsies, a lost heir, and charming women. Ivan Home was produced in 1913, and there was also Heart of Midlothian in 1914. There were two American Lady of the Lake in 1912, one shot in Scotland, another in 1913, and yet another in 1928. There was a fair maid of Perth in 1923. That is a lot of movies with credits to W. Scott. Many, perhaps most of these films, being seen all over the world because, of course, before the coming of sound, the only thing needed to make a film intelligible in any country was to translate the intertitles into the local language. <clears throat> no dubbing, no subtitles, and no great expense. 
which again raises the paradox that the words of the great writer, the vehicle for the plot and transmission of emotion, could only be glimpsed between the pictures. So why are there so many Scott-based movies in the silent era? Clearly the strength of the tales must have something to do with it, but is it not just possible that such was the universal availability of the texts, and in so many language, and that they were familiar to so many millions of readers, that for movie makers in a hurry, they were a very obvious, convenient, attractive source for scripts. That 1923 Fair Maid of Perth, quotes filmed in the authentic locations in Scotland, was described by Bioscope as purely a title booking that may get over with suitable music and effects. Purely a title booking. So the title was the audience made, Scots fame was the draw, whatever the quality of the movie. In other words, it's a piece of opportunism. We'll stick up a title of a, of a novel that you'll have heard of, and never mind whether the film's any good. That's it. it was, that's a very good quote. Purely a title booking. But lest we forget, <coughs> it was not just Scott. <coughs> As Richard Butt points out in his literature and the screen media since 1908 in Edinburgh History of Scottish Literature, Robert Louis Stevenson adaptations are there in quantity too. A version of The Bottle Imp was made in 1909, kidnapped in 1970, and the first of hundreds of Jekyll and Hyde films came out in 1910, 10, <clears throat> the same year as a Norwegian version. Here are a couple of later Jekyll and Hydes. This is the 1931 <clears throat> version with Frederick March. There he goes which got him an Oscar. And this is the much more famous, later one, 1941, with Spencer Tracy. Richard Butt reckons that Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is the third most frequently adapted literary work in movie history, behind only Hamlet and Macbeth. Actually, I wonder if it doesn't overtake one or other of these, given the varieties and variations on its theme in so many guises. There was even a new version of Jekyll and Hyde in development this year and a TV series. From a 21st century perspective then, Stevenson does seem a more likely, does seem more likely than Scott as the purveyor of raw material for the movies. Here is The Master of Bowden Trade, 1953, Errol Flynn, Anthony Steele and Roger Lucy. And you will all of course remember the famous scene with the electric fan. <laughs> it is true that there have been fewer Scott movie adaptations than Stevenson's in recent years, though there was a Lucia in 1998 and on television Scott has done reasonably well. Another Lucia was made for Italian TV in 2003, La Jolie Fille de Perth was made for French TV in 1998, and there have been a couple of Ivan Hoes and Tasman. But Stevenson was way ahead of that. In the last few years, there have been at least 15 Stevenson adapted cinema and TV films, including six Jekyll and Hyde clones. I can't wait to see Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, or the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde rock and roll musical. <laughs> Will they live up to Dr. Pickle and Mr. Pride, Stan Law, Stan Law, 1985? Hammer's Dr. Jekyll and Sister Hyde, or Abbott and Costello meet Jekyll and Hyde, or Dr. Jekyll in a farm, or come to that, the Pirates of Treasure Island, or Treasure Planet. <laughs> Flint and Silver was currently in also pre-production when I first gave this talk ten years ago. Haven't heard of it since. If Scott is currently less involved with filmmakers, what about the third writer whose name was on the early screen as much as Scott and Steen's? J.M. Barry's recent credits in last years have almost all been for Peter Pan. But in the early years of cinema, it was all about The Little Minister, which was made originally 1930, 1950, 1921, 1922. This is the 1934 version of Catherine Hepburn, or The Admirable Crichton, 1930, 1918, etc., etc. This is the 1957 with Kenneth Moore. All in all, Hundreds of films with Scottish literary origins have been made. Richard Butt reckons that as many as a quarter films with Scottish subjects made before 1920 were literary adaptations and based on the work of just the three authors, Scott, Stevenson and Barry. Though not immediately germane to this exercise because his subject matter is in Tartan, it is worth noting that there's actually a fourth Scottish author with a major input to early cinema, Arthur Conan Doyle. 
His novel, Rodney Stone, was made as a house of temporary as early as 1913. I need not, indeed could not, recite all the Sherlock Holmes movies. The director of the 1913 effort, The House of Temporary, was Harold Shaw, an American working in London who claimed he was, quote, pure Scottish by descent. In fact, there were plenty of pure Scots in Hollywood, several, no doubt, took the Waverley novels with them when they immigrated. All this is fascinating and good fun, but a while ago, in the context of Mohawks being keen on the Lady of the Lake, I uttered the word clan. And that takes us into much darker territory. Perhaps you saw the television programme Scotland and the Ku Klux Klan, presented by Neil Oliver. That took as its starting point the very quotation from Mark Twain about Scott that I read to you early in this talk. But the Oliver programme did so with none of the irony that Mark Twain surely intended. Sufficient to say that on the first page of what passed for the constitution of the Ku Klux Klan in 1870, there is a quotation, not from Scott, but from Burns, signalling the undoubted Scottish connection, indeed perceived origins of that movement. More troubling for us when considering the influence of Scott is that the second and even more dangerous manifestation of the Ku Klux Klan came about in 1915, greatly encouraged by the release of D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation. The first part of the film deals in extraordinary and brilliant epic style with the American Civil War. But the second part was based on The Clansman, a novel by the Reverend Thomas Dixon, who seems to have had an impossibly romanticised view of, quote, Old England and Scotland. Old England, presumably from Ivanhoe, and Scotland from Waverley. In the book, Dixon relate that didn't glamorise the story of that first clan and clearly drew on the work of Scott as its phony cultural underpinning. The characters' names are Cameron, McAlpin, Stuart, McAllister, McDuffie, through whose veins flowed the blood of Scottish kings. They are the children of the men who speak the tongue of Burns. They are old-fashioned Scotch Presbyterians with the heritage of the heroic blood of the martyrs of old Scotland. They are the reincarnated souls of the clansmen of old Scotland. Quote, Mr. President, she cried bitterly, you are of Scotch Covenanters' blood. This Griffith, who was the son of a Southern General, translated in the film without regard to the racism or the facts. In it, as the Ku Klux Klan are being gathered in huge numbers to rescue the besieged whites from the wicked blacks, the message is spread by the use of the fiery cross of old Scotland's hills, the practice first described, if not actually invented, by Walter Scott in The Lady of the Lake. As David Orusogo said on Frontline Light, Frontline Late, just last Friday night, apropos Birth of a Nation, people died because of that film. And it is a fact that in the first use of the cross by the Klux Klan, that was ten months after the release of the film, not in the 1870s, as depicted by Dixon. This then is surely an inconvenient truth for us when considering what Sir Walter Scott did for Hollywood or indeed what Scotland did for America. But as you all know, and I didn't till the other day, there's also a sort of redemption for Scott and the Lady of the Lake in that Frederick Douglass, the former slave who became a celebrated abolitionist, chose Douglass, with two S's, as his surname specifically because of the heroic Douglass in Scott's epic poem. And then there's Hail to the Chief from the Lady of the Lake, becoming US President's signature tune but maybe that's beyond redemption. No, no, I, 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 I digress too far. In the late 1970s, there was a great deal of debate in the film community in Scotland. There was books and an exhibition, Scotch Reels. There were a couple of key events which some of you looking around may just remember. There was Film Bang in 1976, and there was Cinema in a Small Country in 1977. Film Bang was described as a cross between a union meeting and a demo. But what was it about? It was supposed to be about the future of filmmaking in Scotland, and indeed to some extent it was, but by no means entirely. The time we were talking about was at the end of a long period in which the only genuine mode of Scottish film expression was in documentary, a most estimable genre to be sure, with its roots in the movement founded by one of the other great Scots, John Grierson, father of the documentary. 
However, in the 1970s, the biggest employer of Scottish cinema filmmaking talent, the Films of Scotland Committee, was in decline following the retiral of its extraordinary director, Forsyth Hardy, who had supervised the making of over 150 documentary films, all financed by public and private organisations and firm, with nary a penny from the government to sustain the, episode, to sustain the effort. Films of Scotland had been set up by government to promote Scotland, but with no money. The chairman, Sir Alexander B. King, said it was a remit without a remittance. <laughs> By the 1970s, also, television rather than the cinema was becoming the natural home for documentary. And many of the filmmakers, people like Bill Forsyth, and that, believe it or not, is Bill Forsyth, Lawrence Henson, Charlie Gormley, Michael Alexander, and a few others, talents nurtured by Hardy, were desperate to make story films. And indeed, some had already begun to do so in a small way through the Children's Film Foundation, which was run in London by another encouraging Scot, Henry Geddes. So the debate was surely to be about money, structures, studios, training, and I was saying that, to some extent, it was. But what is really surprising, looking back at the record now, is the amount of effort and air that was expended, not on practicalities or even politics, but on representation. One could then blame a combination of the academics present, the writers, the critics, and maybe Walter Scott, for contributing to the loss of an opportunity to get filmmaking going properly in Scotland. In fact, it took Bill Forsyth's courage with that sinking feeling and Gregory's girl to demonstrate that it was possible to make genuine indigenous and popular fiction films in Scotland without reference to Hollywood. And the best part of another 20 years before the money and the structure began to catch up with where they should have been all that time ago. And we still haven't got there, got the studio. Well, maybe we have, but that's another talk. Back to the 1970s and the hijacked agenda. The issues, as far as the academics and writers were concerned, were all to do with the regressive, corrupting influences of the Tartanry, the Kilyard, the Walter Scott legacy, and the Scots' pathetic acceptance that their culture was there for the taking by anyone who cared to exploit it. The most celebrated instance of that latter crime, crime and the totemic movie for all subsequently, was, of course, Brigadoon, <laughs> made back in 1954. The case against its perpetrators began with the tale of how the producer, Arthur Freed, was toured around Scotland by Forsyth Hardy, seeking locations for the film. Curus, Dunkel, Braemar, and Inverary were all rejected as unsuitable. Freed returned to Hollywood, having found nowhere in Scotland that looked like the Scotland he was seeking. So the movie was made in Burbank. Maybe there's some sort of comfort in that, but was the Scotland he had in mind the one he had imagined essentially and wrote thanks to Scott? There were, indeed, other plenty of things about Brigadoon to stoke the fires of indignation, if you're so inclined, the story itself for a start. And of course, there are lots of other movies to get upset about and to a greater or lesser degree with traces of Scott, or at least Tartan. I would recommend, if you want to be upset, I recommend you try Geordie, 1950. Five. Trouble in the Glen. Yes, that is Orson Welles. How are the mighty fallen? Uh, oh, yes, who is she? Uh, good, uh, I'll tell you later. <laughs> oh dear, yes, I will find who it is. Um, happy, go, happy Go Lovely, um, 1951. This one, as I'm sure you remember, is set at the Edinburgh Festival. <laughs> Bonnie Scotland, 1935. Yes. Um, the Ghost Goes West. Now, The Ghost Goes West, that's also from Ghost Goes West, uh, it's quite interesting. It was uh, directed by René Clare. It's his first English language film. Um, and in fact, it was the biggest grossing British movie of 1936, so it was very successful. Then, of course, there's Bonnie Prince Charlie. Enough time for you. Niven and Finley Curry, that's 1948. Truly awful, aren't they? Yeah. Annie Laurie with Lillian Gish setting out improbably to stop the massacre of Glen Coe. <laughs> Madam Sin. Yes, I know it's not terribly relevant to this argument, 
But come on, Bette Davis and Mull, how wonderful can you? <coughs> Mary Green Scots. That's the 1971 Red Grave version, or if you prefer, the earlier Mary of Scotland, 1936, with Hebron. We need not list all Brigadoon's uh, outrages here, but a little word of caution. Whisper it softly in the hearing of the Saltire Society or other worthy bodies, maybe even, maybe even this one, but Brigadoon is not actually that bad a film. <laughs> it is very well crafted and it is genuinely entertaining. It's just that somehow, in a strange sort of way, it's almost about us, and, and maybe that's what's upsetting. To blame Sir Walter Scott for Brigadoon seems a bit harsh, but Braveheart, 1995, Mel Gibson from Australia via the USA is another obvious target for those who want to apply that furrow. And in that case, more plausibly, as far as I'm concerned. There is a book by one of those academics I was castigating earlier, Colin MacArthur, Brigadoon, Braveheart and the Scots, Distortions of Scotland in Hollywood Cinema. I do recommend it if you want to be upset. He's, he's, he's really, he really gets, it in, gets in for Scott and lots of other people. Ironically, there was a much more legitimately Walter Scott rated film which came out at the same time, 1995, and that of course was Rob Roy. It was directed by Michael Caton Jones from Broxburn and was actually very good. The fact that it received only one Oscar nomination, quite an achievement in itself, to Braveheart's 10, says something about the benefits to be had from exploiting the right culture in the most commercial way. In that broadcast last Friday night that I referred to, it was agreed that the worst historical film ever was Braveheart. Discuss. But should we really be troubled by all this? Well, maybe, just maybe we should. Maybe the Scotch Reels gang of the 1970s, the Brigadooners, had a point, particularly in relation to Scott's tartanry and Barry's keelyardry, though they did rather tend to ignore evidence that didn't suit their argument. Notably, the films of Bill Douglas, or indeed Peter Watkins and his seminal Culloden. And they were even ambivalent about, for example, Alexander McKendrick's Whiskey Color and, and the Maggie. Incidentally, McKendrick's uh, grandfather was uh, part of the Annan Photographic uh, Establishment in Glasgow. What is certainly true is that mostly the image of our beloved Scotland that has been literally projected to the world over the last hundred years is of a quaint country full of nostalgic, sentimental people given to loud music and bright clothing. <laughs> Whatever else, it has scarcely been representative of the mission of the Scottish Enlightenment. I find myself saying this in this space, in this building. <laughs> In fact, maybe I, should, maybe I should have excised that. Maybe that one should be barred from being seen here. Sorry, advocates. Um, you could argue that if the world wanted, could be bothered to perceive us in those colourful terms, what harm could it do? Good surely to have a unique national identity. Good surely for tourism. But what might be of greater concern is that these curious and distorted images of Scotland and the Scots have, of course, been fed into our own cinemas and thereby given currency among our own population, and therefore back into our own culture. If these then become our perceptions of ourselves, if we believe that, what's, that that's what we really like, do they not become a key negative influence, and then there is a vicious circle and real regression. Would Scott have wanted that? So a hundred years ago was this extremely important development in world entertainment communication, the cinema, a cultural Trojan horse for us, so to speak. Are we still even yet suffering from the arrival of the most popular, accessible, pervasive form of pre-television, pre-internet entertainment? Are our manners and our tastes still shaped by the distorting mirror of Hollywood? And are our modes of cultural expression still affected by it in the exaggerated, ludicrous way in which we've allowed ourselves to be portrayed? For 1911 Lochinvar, do we have to read 2014 Outlander? Is there indeed a trail here, a link from Scott via the movies to contemporary Scottish culture? Some of us had hoped, very much, that the status of Scottish culture would change with devolution. Culture would be key to matters of national policy as well as identity. The tartanry, the kill yardery, would be put in its place. 
New modern modes of expression, digital of course, would obliterate the cultural sins of the fathers. Well, maybe. There are still plenty of tartan dollies out there in the high street. You might observe that nowadays the national dress, as promoted by Scott, the kilt is the rigueur at every wedding and international football match. How much of a connection we can legitimately make between the superficial exploiting of Scott's work? For that is really what it is, not an addressing of his real genius as a writer. A connection between that and our current condition. I do not know. Were Scott and co good news for Hollywood, but not good news for us? Is the nature of cinema itself to blame, or are there signs of Scottish cinema that we're getting over it? Red Road, Shallow Grave, Train Spotting, Hound Fall, <coughs> Sweet Sixteen, Dear Frankie, A Fond Kiss, Rat Catcher, My Name is Joe, etc., and not much sign of Scott or Hollywood or Tartan in those. Or are we still enthralled to the Walter Scott derivation and distortion that gave rise to Brigid Dillon? But let's look at the balance sheet. If Scott is to get credit for influence on Hollywood, Hollywood, for example in the cowboy convention of the one-on-one -on -one shootout in the dusty Main Street with its origins in chivalric medievalisms of Ivanhoe, or indeed the idea that Scotland is a romantic and attractive country, then that's probably something to be proud of. If on the other hand his version of Scotland leads to Brigadoon and a perception by others and even by ourselves that we are simply quaint, that is not, that is hardly welcomed. So on that latter note, may I leave you with a couple of brief quotes. They are to do essentially with Brigadoon. And the first one is from Murray Grigger and his, um, <coughs> his, his, his grotesque you saw a, little, a few months ago. Murray says, what makes Brigadoon's fantasy of a past that never existed important is its potential to fuel the theme parkization of Scotland. In a country which allows standing stones to be bulldozed away and awards tourist grants for, to historical blasphemies, the fake lore of Brigadoon begins to dominate the folklore of our real yesterdays. Carl McDougall said, The extent to which the Brigadoon perceptions have distilled down to us who live here is obvious when there is a serious lobby to turn Flower of Scotland into a national anthem. Is Brigadoon more or less than Flower of Scotland? The sentiments are, to my mind, my mind, even more distasteful, romantic nonsense, which is clearly nonsense. That's one thing, but dying for a wee bit hill and glen is another. And finally from Donald Campbell. Brigadoon's success has promoted a perception of Scotland which, although grotesquely erroneous, is curiously persistent creating a very real obstruction to the understanding of genuine Scottish culture throughout the world. I've lost count of the number of times that people from other countries have told me, intending as a compliment, that my work is not really Scottish. What they mean, of course, is that my drama has nothing in common with Brennan too. This makes me feel like the grandson of Cochise, who, on applying for work as an extra on a film about his grandfather, was turned down in the grounds that he didn't look like an Apache. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
uh, to, to whisper it not in the ears of the Saltire Society, in other words, it's exactly what you're talking about. Um, that's actually rather good. If you actually sit down and watch Billy Doom, you watch it. You know, it's very well done. It's cinemascope, it's colourful, the dance and the music is great. Okay, it's a piece of nonsense. But of course, it's about somebody going back in time, which is exactly the same plot as Outlander, isn't it? So, in, in other words, we still have that effect. But yes, I, I, I take your point, and I, I have a lot of sympathy with it. I think it's awfully easy to be superior about this and say, gosh, look what they've done to us. But we can enjoy it. But isn't that the point? Mm. That films are for entertainment. Yeah. In Scotland, we can look out of the front door and yeah. see real life around us. Yeah. Isn't it nice that there's something entertaining to take our minds off that? I truly agree. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, there's nothing like displacement by watching a good movie. But when the movie is actually doing something about something that you recognize, a place you recognize, an attitude you recognize, and it is distorting it, it can be kind of. Well, I'm using very good in this to attempt, but as I indicated, there's lots and lots of other movies that distort Scotland and Scotland's representation. And it becomes a bit uncomfortable. Also, if you're trying to persuade people to make films in Scotland about what is genuinely our concerns, and that's why I cited things like Rap Catcher, you're talking about the classic, films like that, Home for Sweet Sixteen, it's, it's a pity to have this other stuff as, as background. So to try and get people to take our cultural seeds and not just simply accept the way, accept the way that cinema has been sold to us and our perception of cinema, as a means of cultural expression, beyond it being entertainment. I mean, I hope it is entertaining, but at cinema should also be more than that. But isn't it more than that with Grayson? This way? Don't Grayson's films make it more than that? Oh yes, Grayson's films <coughs> absolutely more than that. But they are documentary. Why couldn't? Why can't we have fiction films uh, which do the same job? Of course, Grayson himself. Not many people know this, but Grayson himself actually did produce two or three fiction films. One was The Brave Don't Cry, and one was, was a, a, was a follow-up almost to Whiskey Law and the Maggie, um, called Laxdale Hall. Do you all know Laxdale Hall? If you don't know Laxdale Hall, get hold of it. It's a lovely film. It's a very, very funny film. It's about the people of Apple Cross, that shot in Apple Cross, uh, who have refused to pay their road fund license on the grounds that they don't have a road. <laughs> and receive a parliamentary delegation, which inevitably is corrupted by the wise cunning natives, and goes away persuaded that they shouldn't have to, or that they should get a road. But that was actually produced by John Grierson, which is, comes as a bit of a surprise. But I do recommend Laxley Hall if you've not met it. Am I the only one, have you seen Laxley Hall? Am I the only one who knows it? Oh, I say, go out, you can go and get it. Hooray, hooray. It's lovely, isn't it? It's, it includes the first um, first screen appearances of Ricky Fulton. Uh, Prunella Scales, would you believe, is the, is the romantic lead. She afforded I digress. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> is this uh, that Scotland necessarily have this treatment of, more than other places? I mean, my favourite film when I was about 10 or 11 was uh, The Prisoner of Zender. Yeah. I'm sure that didn't give an accurate portrayal of Rory Tania. Or... <laughs> <laughs> well, you see, that, that's, interesting. that's interesting. And that's a question, as you gather, I have given this talk once or twice before. Yeah. And that's a question that, that always comes up. Is it just us? Or are there other people? And immediately people will cite Ireland. And they say the corrupt versions of the Irish. But there is a difference. And the difference is the authors, the difference is the, the writers, the difference is the Scott, the Barry, the Stevenson. That that's the sources, whereas the, the kind of silly conventions of Irishness are not really born out of literature in quite the same way. And I think that's the I've also had Russia chucked to me as another example. And I think there might even be some more virtue in that. So you were trying to get in at the back. Yes, I was just with the um, process of association. Um, one notable biographer, but less so known about him now, is uh, John Buchan had gone completely yeah. out of fashion, but he was a great member of intelligence, proper imperialist propagandist yeah. as well. Oh. But some of, there must have been a terrific industry of the people that could write, which then gave you scripts yeah. from which to work. And it's a great virtue, I think, of the prolific nature of Stevenson and, uh, um, and Scott, when he actually gave the filmmakers 
scripts, and I think that's what you guys in the film industry yes. actually need. Who comes up with a universally themed, a well, diametrically opposite, it's like storytelling, I'm, meriting, I'm, 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 I'm struggling with this, but I, I think the last film version based on Scott, in any kind of sense, was in fact that Rob Roy, the Michael Caton Jones, who as I mentioned is native born and brought up in Broxburg. Um, I think that's the last time I can think of a genuine local, as it were, version of Scott. And I really don't see people queuing up these days to do a film version of a Scott novel. I wish they were. Uh, they're more likely to be queuing up to do another Jekyll and Hyde. People are always doing Jekyll and Hyde. But that doesn't even have to be particularly high street in the shooting. So there's a question from behind as well. Well, it, it was mostly Peter's question. Okay. And I'll, I'll throw Eamon at you as well. As I, yeah. I mean, I, I just wonder if that's what film did in the <laughs> 20s and 30s. I, mean, I was thinking of Alexander Corden, yes. who would always buy up the stock of a, a, a major novel from a country. Yes. And exactly. then kind of impose a sort of three or four cliches of the country. I mean, so England in his films is always rural. Mock Tudor, is it, with is bits it, of central London thrown in and some copies. Would, no would it be possible to do this lecture on the basis of Ivanhoe and how the England was, how medieval England was created by Walter Scott and what heritage, what legacy there is of that in the way in which certain aspects of English <coughs> history, it's an interesting thought, and I bet you could. I bet there would be a case for that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So the, the Shakespeare's well, probably. Yes, you're right. <laughs> he comes in as well. But that is that's a very interesting, interesting thought. Uh, just appropriate to that, I met one way around here. Owen Dudley Edwards, who yes. sent his uh, regrets for not being here, uh -huh. he says, make sure they give it. He says he could talk for long and forever about Ivanhoe and the great. Yeah. Um, what impact we all had at the time. Yeah. It, my understanding also was that it was Ivanhoe that created the idea of Old England um, <clears throat> and Waverley that created the idea of Old Scotland, correctly, of the, of, the, of the Jacobite Rising and so on, and that these became the, almost the set text from which, everything else, from which everything else flowed. I told you you were going to tell me more than I tell you, but I do think that is, is, is very interesting. Now, you want me to stop, don't you? Uh, one, two more, because there's a lot of questions. Okay, right. Five minutes. Oh, sure. <laughs> That's what that meant. Yeah. Right. Any yes, we'll see. I, I think you mentioned Ireland. I did. And we suffered from the same uh, misrepresentation. People expect Collins leading donkeys around very picturesque lanes, especially after Morris Welch's. Quiet man. I was going to say the quiet man comes quiet to mind. It brought, it brought yeah. loads of tourists, but they were disappointed because they were they did not see the, the they saw houses and they didn't see cottages they didn't see you know, colleens going around as they Absolutely. said. Absolutely, no, I mean, totally. And as I was telling the story of Arthur Freed, the producer of Brigadier, comes to Scotland, his tour around all the obvious locations, says this doesn't look like the Scotland I was expecting. And I, I will just tell one very brief personal story that my very was my very first job was conducting an American filmmaker around Scotland, and he was making a. It was in the days when you made films and showed them back in Carnegie Hall and did live comedy to them, uh, and uh, he demanded of me that he had a very good idea of one thing she really wanted, and what it was was he wanted a little thatched cottage with roses round the door, and a dear old lady, you know. And I had said, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, Harry, but you know what you don't, actually that's not how it is. And over the next few weeks, he kept on demanding that I found this. Well, well we'd just come off the ferry from Skye at Elbow, and he was driving, and he suddenly put his foot on the brakes, so and we nearly ended in a ditch, and back there, was a little cottage. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it was corrugated iron roof, but there were roses round the door, and there was a little old lady there. <laughs> and as punishment, I was made to walk up the path in shot, being filmed, being greeted by the little old lady as the long lost. <laughs> so sometimes the stereotypes win out. <laughs> and I think 
that bit. I think we'll stop there. <laughs> and before we, we finally thank you, I just draw your attention uh, to our next talk, which will be given on Thursday the 29th November at 7 o'clock by Professor Angela Esterhammer of the University of Toronto, her topic being Scott and the World in 1824. This is open to club members and their guests. Tickets are still available from Lee Simpson. If you're interested in joining the club, details can be found through the contacts page in our website, www.walterscottclub.com, or just type in Edinburgh Scott Club into the Google box and you'll find your way there. Uh, it's now a pleasure to call on Professor Penny Fielding to offer our virtual thanks. Thank you, Peter. Uh, thank you, David, for a wonderful talk that was in equal measure informative and entertaining. And I'm sure uh, everybody here learned quite a lot of facts that they didn't know before. I certainly did. Uh, and it was a particular pleasure to realise how Scott is not just what we read in the novels, how important he is in a much, much wider culture from the operas of the 19th century to uh, the films that you discussed. And also how that, your talk brought that time um, much closer to us. I was astonished to see a photograph of Henry Coburn's daughter in a, in a, a tableau of um, the antiquary. Um, my interest in Scott was piqued in the 1970s by a television uh, adaptation of Rob Roy. So uh, it was a particular, a great pleasure for me to um, see all these other adaptations that I had no idea existed. So, on behalf of the Walter Scott Club and the University of Edinburgh, thank you very much indeed for such a wonderful talk.